Bernard Delberg joined the Merck Group in 2009, two years after the international launch of a vaccine aimed at becoming what the industry calls a blockbuster, a product that brings in over a billion dollars a year. Its name was Gardasil. Presented as a major breakthrough, this vaccine would be supported, despite doubts, by nearly every political representative in the world. Gardasil is a vaccine developed to fight viruses called HPV. These are viruses that have been shown to cause cancer, in particular cervical cancer in women. The problem is that Gardasil was sold, and continues to be sold, by making people believe in a wonderful medical fairy tale, that it will eliminate the HPV epidemic, the epidemic of viral cancers. But the frequency of this cancer, to put it in simple terms, is diminishing every year. It cannot be called an epidemic. Before commercializing this vaccine, Merck launched a series of clinical trials in several American hospitals under the leadership of major researchers. They did not have expertise within the companies to be able to develop this clinically. Diane Harper is recognized as one of the world's leading experts on the HPV virus. They asked the small number of international experts, of which I was one, to help them design the trials, design what would be appropriate for human endpoints, and design how those trials should be put together that was safe and protected the, the person who was entering into the trial. So I became um, the largest enroller in the United States in the phase two trial. Much data, many publications on it. The whole goal of developing the vaccine was so that we could get prevention of cervical cancer. Proving the efficacy of a vaccine is a complex process, especially when it's about preventing an emergence of cancer. Merck and other in-house researchers therefore worked diligently to prove that the vaccine eliminated four specific viruses responsible for the majority of cervical cancers. The vaccine was close to 100% eff effective, or I should say efficacious. Um, we were very excited. And then Merck told us how they were going to take it and move it from there. And that became very scary. That wow. became, it was an incredibly organized um, way of reaching every possible organization there could be that could have any effect on making decisions about vaccination and making sure that people's responses were going to be, yes, we want Gardasil. In 2006, Merck received market approval for the vaccine in the United States. It then began an unprecedented campaign to make cervical cancer a national and international cause, and to convince people that Gardasil was the solution to eradicating this illness. The first target for lobbyists were American politicians. A few months later, Rick Perry, the newly elected Republican governor of Texas, was the first to declare a federal law mandating vaccination for all young women in his state. He made a solemn announcement during his inauguration. At the forefront of a new era of prosperity, the, its arrival. For the first time ever, we have a vaccine that can prevent a cancer, a cancer that prevents the spread of HPV, the leading cause of cervical cancer in women. I refuse to look a young woman in the eye who suffers from this form of cancer and tell her that we could have stopped it, but we didn't. I'm going to err on the side of protecting life. As governor, Rick Perry um, made an executive order uh, that 
all young girls age 12 uh, were mandated to get the vaccine Gardasil made by Merck. A few years ago, Roy Poses created a foundation for transparency in scientific research. Uh, also, Rick Perry receives considerable five figures in US dollars, contributions from a political action committee identified with Merck. And third, um, Rick Perry's former chief of staff uh, was hired by Merck to be a lobbyist. So we have um, two kinds of influence. We have the, the donation and we have the revolving door. And we have an action, which I'd say is a fairly strong action by government to influence the use of a particular product. The first person to publicly reveal these close relations was a female politician in Rick Perry's own camp. During a televised debate between Republican presidential candidates, Michelle Bachmann openly accused the governor of playing into the laboratory's hands. I raise about $30 million. That we cannot forget that in the midst of this executive order, there was a big drug company that made millions of dollars because of this mandate. We can't, we can't deny that. What are you suggesting? What I'm saying is that it's wrong for a drug company because the, the governor's former chief of staff was the chief lobbyist for this drug company. The drug company gave thousands of dollars in political donations to the governor, and this is just flat out wrong. Right. The, the question is, is it about life or was it about millions of dollars and potentially wow. billions for a drug company? In 2007, Rick Perry was far from being the only politician to publicly endorse Gardasil. All over the world, in just a few weeks, dozens of parliamentarians were suddenly raising the issue of mass vaccination for cervical cancer. Monsieur le ministre, en France, Le cancer du col de l'utérus atteint chaque année 3000 femmes et cause la, la mort de 1000 d'entre elles. In Europe, the drug was given market approval for the entire continent. For several years already, these decisions have been made by the European Medicines Agency and not the individual states. The European Medicines Agency is first and foremost an organization that's 80% financed by the pharmaceutical laboratories. Michel Rivasi is a member of the European Parliament. She's part of the Health Committee based in Brussels. 80% of this agency's revenue comes from pharmaceutical laboratories requesting market approvals. Only 20% comes from Europe. In other words, when you request a market approval, you pay to get it. And that constitutes, if you will, your share of the agency's funding. That means the more drugs the agency authorizes, the more money it receives via the pharmaceutical labs. And that's very important, because the way an agency is funded is something that allows you to assess its independence. For me, there's no guarantee that when market approval is given, it means that a drug has any real added value. I think that a lot of politicians, not just in France but in all of Europe, allowed themselves to be deluded by a kind of medical fairy tale in which the dream had finally become real. We had the first anti-cancer vaccine. Of course, we all wanted to believe that, but unfortunately, the medical reality of numbers and facts showed that wasn't the case at all. Objectively and scientifically speaking, no one can know the real efficacy of this vaccine. A politician might have some knowledge of health and say, no, there's something wrong with that. But since politicians tend to believe whatever anyone in a white lab coat says, they don't react. Our society dances to the tune of the all-powerful lobbies. And the states are simply there to implement the agenda of the lobbies. It's unbelievable. All over Europe, doctors are divided about Gardasil. Some are strong advocates, while others have serious doubts about its efficacy. 
In Spain, officials voted to vaccinate the local youth. Yet the country is one of the least affected by the HPV virus and cervical cancer. A baffling public health decision in the eyes of hundreds of researchers. Each country has its own history of health and its own sexual practices. Controlling the relation between human beings and these viruses is an absolutely unobtainable pipe dream. Carlos Alvarez Dade is one of the first doctors to have been shocked by the behavior of his country's leaders. Before the first scientific articles were even published, a congresswoman asked when we were going to launch the vaccine, which means that she had inside information. She was promoting the vaccine in Parliament. And at that point, we published an article in a Spanish newspaper asking for a moratorium on the vaccine. Half of the country's public health doctors signed, saying the vaccine wasn't suitable. We did a study, and it demonstrated that to save one life with Gardasil, it would cost the state 8 million euros. One of the people who signed this open letter was Ildefonso Hernández Aguado, one of Spain's top researchers. It was clear that right from the start, decisions were being influenced by vested interests. Ildefonso Hernández Aguado participated directly in the Gardasil debates. Who decides the scientific agenda? The pharmaceutical companies. That's what I noticed when I came to the ministry. The political agenda was controlled through a series of imperceptible actions, actions that seemed completely natural. And companies influence politicians every time they need to. That way, they say, they're in control of the situation. In reality, when they do this, they influence politicians at every level of power, from the head of state down to the bottom of the ladder, if necessary. That's the way they do it. It was particularly visible in people I knew personally, who were directly pressured to change their opinion in support of the pharmaceutical industry. You saw this? I saw it directly, yes. In Spain and across the globe, once Gardasil had the backing of the authorities, Merck launched a publicity campaign that was unprecedented for a vaccine. With a slogan hammered out in every language, every vaccinated girl is one cervical cancer victim less. It can prevent hundreds of deaths from cervical cancer in the UK every year. When Merck started pushing the marketing so hard, they started to publicly make statements of, your daughter will be one less with vaccination. I talked to them and said, this isn't appropriate. And they said, fear sells. If we make moms afraid of the disease, they'll vaccinate their daughters. And they said, that's our business, not yours. Um, it became very clear to me that Merck appears to have lost their public health purpose and that their potential profit and reporting to their shareholders has become more important for Gardasil than what it really can do for the public. If Diane Harper is against the marketing, it's because she believes that scientifically this massive vaccination campaign makes no sense. Against most of it protects you against 70% of cervical cancers. In its ads, Merck claimed its vaccine could prevent 70% of cervical cancers, a number that makes Diane Harper furious. Someone asked me what HPV is. I would tell them HPV is a common sexually transmitted. 
let's look at this group of women who are all normal women. We have about two and a half percent of those women who have a 1618 infection, and they're completely normal. If we then look at the women who have a high grade disease, but it's not cancer, half of those women have 1618, okay? Because it stayed with them. And now of those, that it's a smaller circle. And then of the small circle who actually get cancer, it is about 70%, again, depending on where you are in the world. So it's the same HPV that was that two and a half percent here that is now reduced by 90% because only 90% of them actually get to that stage that cause 70% of cancers. So 70% sounds like a really big number, but given that the cancers are small here, 70% is a small number worldwide. In France, a number of unexpected stories emerged alongside the vaccination campaign. thousands of girls began reporting serious side effects. In the city of Valenciennes in the north of France, Jennifer is one of the girls who claim their lives were turned upside down by the vaccine. My mom's a school nurse, and she was told about Gardasil. She told us it was a good idea to get vaccinated against cervical cancer. At that age, we trusted our mom, and we did it without thinking. That was in 2007, so I was 18 years old. A few days after the third injection of Gardasil, Jennifer Sellier got sick. Starting in June 2008, my period disappeared completely. I consulted my GP, who said that that sometimes happens in young women. After my period stopped, I got cold sweats at night, insomnia, huge weight gain, hot flashes, basically all the symptoms of menopause. So I went to see my gynecologist, who took a blood test that revealed premature menopause, autoimmune overitis, and that was the beginning of hell. In addition to premature menopause, Jennifer's medical examinations showed that she had developed HPV lesions, the very thing the vaccine is supposed to prevent. I underwent laser treatment three times for the HPV lesions. It's ridiculous. You're vaccinated to be protected against these lesions, and then you get them. Jennifer's case isn't unique. All over Europe, hundreds of young women claim to have developed illnesses after being vaccinated. There's a big tolerance issue, which is still unresolved today. There's no proof for or against. But there are big questions about major side effects like multiple sclerosis, which has been front page news in France for the past few months, or potentially more serious side effects, with deaths being reported here and there. It's all very disturbing. Today we have no definitive proof that the vaccine is dangerous or life-threatening. Something is happening, but as of today, no one knows exactly what. Gardasil has been controversial since the very first day it was prescribed. Legal notices make mention, in fact, of potentially serious side effects. Even if it's not possible to establish a causal relationship, between the vaccine and illnesses such as pulmonary embolus, pancreatitis, or even death. Eight years after the start of the vaccination campaigns, neither scientists nor authorities have been able to make any definitive conclusions about Gardasil. Merck contracted with the Nordic countries to follow the women who were vaccinated. There were about 3,000 women vaccinated and to follow them for the next 10 years. That was in fact required by the FDA for a phase four um, surveillance study, post-marketing surveillance study. Merck has done that. What we have seen 
reported at conferences because nothing has been published, nothing has gone through peer review and is available um, to the public to read. What we see in conferences is that we started off with 3,000 women and by six years they could only follow up 1,700 women. And by eight years they could only follow up 500 women. So the people that they could follow continue to show pretty good effectiveness, but there's so many people that we haven't been able to follow that you don't know what that means. Despite the doubts, Gardasil continues to enjoy the support of politicians. The President of France himself promoted Gardasil during his presentation of the National Cancer Plan. The cancer du col de l'utérus fera également, et c'est une des annonces du plan cancer, l'objet d'un dépistage systématique. D'ici cinq ans, nous doublerons la couverture vaccinale contre le cancer du col de l'utérus, ce qui permettra son éradication à terme. When our president said we'll double the vaccination against Gardasil, that was the first time ever that a president has talked about a drug. It's true that there are a thousand deaths due to cervical cancer. That's sad. But there are hundreds of thousands of deaths from other cancers, and they don't allocate the same resources towards them. Also, there's an alternative for cervical cancer, which is pap smears. They should be done regularly every year. It's not expensive, and if caught early, those women won't die of cervical cancer. We should set some priorities here. Given its price, given the public recommendations, there have been years when Gardasil cost taxpayers over a billion euros. My regrets are that so much money has been spent on this vaccine in so many places with so many hopes of prevention that what are we going to be saying to these women 30 years from now if it doesn't work. Today, several studies around the world are attempting to precisely determine the vaccine's efficacy. The results should be known in the coming years, if, that is, these studies are completed. Because for the past few months, Merck has been considering stopping production of Gardasil as we know it in favor of a new vaccine. What makes this especially discouraging is that Merck is getting ready to come out with a different Gardasil kind of vaccine. And with that, they're going to stop giving Gardasil and start with a new vaccine. So it's like we're starting time over again. And we don't know again how long is this going to last. So all of the women who have truly been part of this big public health experiment for the last 10 years, we won't know how effective it is. Are Gardasil's virtues just a marketing falsehood aimed at selling an imperfect product? Or do they truly represent scientific progress? It's a legitimate question given the surge in pharmaceutical scandals around the world in the last few years. Scandals that affect the confidence of the patients we might all potentially become. The pharmaceutical industry didn't always have a bad reputation. For decades, it was seen as one of the best ways to extend life expectancy. But in the 1990s, a combination of events changed things completely. It was the end of the triumph of chemistry and the beginning of the pattern problem. Expiries, generics, development difficulties, prices that started shooting up. The big Western countries, the United States, didn't want to pay through the nose for drugs anymore. That's when Merck executives decided to cross the red line and cheat the system. Bernard Delberg uses the term red line deliberately. He's referring to a case dating back 10 years, the Vioxx lawsuit. It's one of the biggest drug scandals of the 20th century. Vioxx was a drug for arthritis, the chronic joint illness that affects millions of people. 
Merck presented Vioxx as a groundbreaking drug. Vioxx was a super aspirin that was supposed to be groundbreaking in that, unlike other anti-inflammatories, it had fewer digestive side effects. All the scientific literature on Vioxx at the time was extremely positive, both fundamentally and in terms of the clinical trials. These trials demonstrated without a shadow of a doubt that it was as efficient and sometimes more efficient than other super aspirins of the time, with fewer digestive secondary effects and a general tolerance that seemed pretty good, in particular on a cardiovascular level. So it was clearly progress. Everyone believed in it. And then people started dying. A scandal broke in the early 2000s when dozens of Americans testified on TV that they or their relatives had had a heart attack after taking Vioxx. Carol Ernst's husband, a 59-year-old marathon runner, died from it. In 2001, she filed the first complaint against Merck. Consumers have the right to know what the risks are when you take a drug. The country's greatest lawyers instantly jumped on the case. One of them was Christopher Seeger, a class action specialist. His first task was to find out what the scientific community thought about Vioxx, a task more difficult than it appeared. In 2001, there was an article published in the Journal of the American Medical Association, JAMA. And that article was just basically what they said is they took a look at Vioxx and they basically said, we have a red flag here. I can't, we, we're not gonna say there's really something going on, but we think there's a red flag. We've looked at the science. We've looked at people who've had problems. You know, first you wanna find out if there's a biological plausibility. So if somebody says a drug causes something, it's good to hear from a scientist that there, there's some biological plausibility. Yeah, I see how that can happen. And that happened with Vioxx. Well, one of the most difficult things about that case for me at the time is I had a hard time finding experts who would say anything bad about Merck. Several researchers were in fact working to determine whether this drug was or was not dangerous for the heart. But if no researchers were talking, it was because on the other end, Merck was doing whatever it could to smother the growing scandal. What they said was they wanted to neutralize the opposition. Merck wasn't exactly happy uh, to have people have doubts. Um, and I know there were various instances where they either tried to persuade people or they tried to gain the, um, uh, the support of people um, for the drug, um, but not by showing evidence that the drug was better. So it was... Uh, to use the influence of money to influence them to be more favorable to their drug. A document seized at Merck after the first complaints were filed illustrated the way the company was influencing leading American physicians. It revealed that the laboratory was using its financial power to buy them. The document mentioned $50,000 in funding as well as studies commissioned by Merck for some of its drugs and doctors requesting large honorariums to support the company. Standard practice, according to Bernard Dalberg. In my whole career, I've seen maybe one or two people resist offers of transversal collaboration. Let's use that modest term. The thing is, They've got a problem. They have to find funding for their own research, at least, even if they don't want to work with manufacturers. So they're forced to work with them. Unfortunately, they have no other choice. Merck literally launched a campaign against those doctors, not just to discredit them with the science, but they discredited them on a very personal level. They tried to make them look like they were buffoons, like they didn't understand the science, and they attacked them. One particular scientist who was critical of the drug, they tried to get him fired from the university he was associated with. Neutralize in the common parlance would be a word that the CIA or the mafia would use. 
David Egelman served as an expert in some of the complaints filed against Mayock. He's read all of the studies and classified documents related to Vioxx. The Mafia would break your leg or your arm. The CIA would shoot you. And in Merck's case, um, they either offered people incentives or they, if that wasn't an approach that was amenable to the controlling the person who was speaking badly about Viox, they would um, try to discredit them. I don't think that's a very scientific approach to uh, the truth. There's no reliable scientific evidence in this case that Viox had anything to do with uh, Mr. Ernst's tragic death. Um, there um, uh, just simply doesn't exist. Despite the company's denials, by September 2004, the scandal had grown so great that Merck decided to stop production of Viox. We are voluntarily withdrawing Viox effective today. And we're taking this action because we believe it best serves the interests of patients. We believe it would have been possible to continue to market Viox with labeling that would incorporate these new data. However, given the availability of alternative therapies and the questions raised by the data, we concluded that a voluntary withdrawal is the responsible course to take. I want to hear about Dr. Graham's study today. What really pushed Merck to take its drug off the market, in fact, was an irrefutable study done by this man, David Graham, a researcher at the U.S. Food and Drug Administration. Mr. Chairman and members of the committee, good morning. My name is David Graham, and I'm pleased to come before you today to speak about Viox, heart attacks, and the FDA. This report estimated that nearly 28,000 excess cases of heart attack and sudden cardiac death had been caused by Viox. I must emphasize to the committee that this is an extremely conservative estimate. This estimate ranges from 88,000 to 139,000 Americans. Of these, 30 to 40 percent probably died. For the survivors, their lives were changed forever. Today, in 2004, we are faced with what may be the single greatest drug safety catastrophe in the history of this country. I strongly believe that this should have been, and largely could have been, avoided. But it wasn't. An important message for people who have taken... After this statement, the Viox commercials that had flooded American televisions were replaced by ads from lawyers offering to sue Merck. After taking Viox, Viox may be... The company was suspected not just of having tried to silence Viox's critics, but more importantly, to have covered up the drug's lethal effects. 1-877-308-7900. 1-877-308. And emails, you know, tell a very revealing story. You know, I know that people say, oh, I just wrote something at midnight. I was just, I was tired. But when you start to see email after email, and some of these that go back to the mid-90s when they're developing the drug, where scientists in the company are saying, before they ever put it in the first person, that there is a potential for this kind of problem. And then they did studies in mice, and they saw problems. And then they did studies in people, and they saw problems. Indeed, internal emails showed that before Viox was commercialized, Merck had already recorded a number of deaths from heart attacks. It's clear that Merck deliberately lied about the study results and deliberately hid for years the fact that there were cardiovascular deaths. Laboratories are the only ones to have the structural and financial resources to be able to pay for these trials. So you have to understand that they control everything. To show a side effect that happens in one out of a thousand people, it has to be tested in nearly 50,000 people. There isn't a pharmaceutical company out there that does that kind of testing before they sell. The real testing ground is you and me and our parents and our wives and our children. Apart from Merck's responsibility, the American authorities wanted to know if the lab had received any special favors, in particular from the FDA, the American Drug Administration. Some of this the FDA knew, even though it wasn't public because the FDA had access to non-public data. So if it was obvious, then it wasn't just Merck's mistake, it was the FDA's mistake too. 
So in many ways, the government agent, the regulatory agency and the company have to work together to say, we were shocked there was gambling in Casablanca. It was again David Graham who revealed the relations between Merck and the FDA. In his statement before the Senate, he openly condemned the attempts at intimidation he experienced at his agency. We'll do a second round and last round of this panel so we can move on. Uh, Dr. Graham? I was pressured to change my conclusions and recommendations. One drug safety manager recommended that I should be barred from presenting the poster at the meeting and also noted that Merck needed to know our study results. So I guess Merck needed to know the results, but the public didn't. Thank you, Dr. Graham. The meeting adjourned. The biggest problem is its uh, social interaction with the companies, let's say. Okay? So in, in terms of Vioxx, for example, which is similar, there's one physician at the FDA who's in charge. Okay? Now, that physician at the FDA is dealing with the Merck people, and they have a whole army of people. So they develop a social relationship, right? All right, and, and nothing, you know, and, and so they don't want to. They don't want to get into. Would you want to be working with someone and having fights every week? Honig, who was in charge of Vioxx, went to work for Merck. He left work on a Friday, and he went to work at Merck on the next Monday, two days later. Okay, that's what he did. He said in his deposition, he decided over the weekend to leave. He said he tried to recuse himself. Tried. Okay? He tried. In November 2007, in the United States, Merck agreed to settle the lawsuits. On the news line right now, helping us react to the, the Merck settlement, $4.85 billion related to the Vioxx painkiller suit. Uh, they do not admit uh, causation or fault. This deals with half the plaintiffs, a third of the cases. Some estimates were $50 billion if you added up all the number crunching here. Merck signed an agreement to compensate victims in exchange for no fault being imputed to the company. Did we get a legal admission of fault? No. Uh, there's nothing in a document where they say we did this, we're sorry. But I think that was a nice way to say I'm sorry also, you know, by paying the victims of their, um, of their wrongdoing. When you pay $4.85 billion, anybody out there listening to this, if you think that's not an admission of fault, you're wrong. These are companies that want to make money. They don't want to spend money. And if they spend money, they want to spend it on making new products. So for any pharmaceutical company, particularly one that makes nine or ten billion dollars and I understand that's a lot of money but for them to pay f almost half of that out almost five billion dollars is an admission of fault. The paradox of the American justice system is that officially despite this agreement no one could be held responsible for the deaths that occurred among Vioxx users especially not Raymond Gilmartin Merck's CEO at the time. I don't think anybody was technically fired, but many of the senior executives who were around during Vioxx left. Ray Gilmartin, who's the CEO of the company, retired and went on to other things. Very rich men, by the way. Um, you know, because they had stock options and they owned an interest in the company. And when they retired, they were able to sell those and retire very comfortably, much more comfortably than it, most of the people who got compensation through the program. On Wall Street, the Vioxx affair had little effect on investors. Stocks wavered briefly, then everything returned to normal. Shares even increased in value. When the Vioxx scandal broke, Merck's market capitalization was around 40 to 50 billion dollars. Today, if financial websites are to be believed, it's worth 140 billion dollars. That means one thing that despite the Vioxx scandal, which was, I repeat, the greatest drug scandal the planet has ever known, despite enormous fines, despite the company's atrocious image, it continues to grow and in 10 years has tripled its market capitalization. That's something a lot of companies dream of. For the company, the Vioxx affair was now part of the past. Officially, these methods were no longer employed. But Bernard d'Alberg would soon worry about being embroiled in a new scandal when, in 2009, 
his employer decided to market a new treatment for hepatitis C, Victrellis. The global market was estimated at at least $1 billion. So it was a huge market, what we call a blockbuster market. Other competitors were announced, and there were many, at least three competitors in the next two to three years. So it was obvious that this drug had to be launched as quickly as possible with the largest possible number of indications because its lifespan was very limited and therefore its sales would be too. In this kind of situation, laboratories request an expedited market authorization. To increase their chances of obtaining it, they prepare the drug's presentation with world-renowned doctors. For Victrellis, they contacted a hepatologist based at the Saint Antoine Hospital in Paris, a prominent physician named Laurent Serfati. This was someone with great technical and scientific knowledge. There was nothing wrong with him being placed as an opinion leader. He worked in total honesty with the laboratory under contracts declared to the National Medical Association. The contracts were transparent and fell within a completely normal framework of interests. But then all of a sudden, there was a problem because he was appointed to be an expert by the authorities. That was the problem. Bernard Alberg and his colleagues submitted a request for use to the National Drug Agency. A few days later, they discovered that the French authorities had chosen from among a list of hundreds of names an expert they knew, a certain Laurent Serfati. I alerted everyone, locally and internationally, to the fact that there was a conflict of interest. Despite Bernard Alberg's alerts, and despite the reassuring answers he received, no one at Merck ended relations with Laurent Serfati. People in subsidiaries, in management, with huge responsibilities on their shoulders to launch new products with gigantic sales figures, well, they looked away and thought, if we stay quiet, we'll increase our chance of reaching our sales and our goals. And so we reach a second level here, which is that this isn't a slip-up anymore. Things have spun out of control and there's no way to stop it. On April the 12th, 2010, Merck went to the National Drug Agency to present Victrellis. The stakes were high for the laboratory. The goal was to obtain a temporary authorization for the drug's use in order to hit the market before competitors. One of the first people to endorse this advance authorization was the state commissioned expert. That expert was Dr. Serfati, who, during the meeting, once the results had been presented, was absolutely in favor of granting a temporary authorization for use in France. Merck had got what it had come for. The laboratory could now promote its drug to French doctors. Victralis was presented as a breakthrough for people suffering from hepatitis C. It was the first step to the drug's commercialization. Immediately afterwards, the laboratory received market approval for Victralis for all of Europe. Looking back, the story of this drug raises a deeper question. Why go to all this trouble if the drug was so efficient? Was there a risk in prescribing Victralis? Sophie Chipon is a university professor living near Nice. For the past 20 years, she's lived with hepatitis C. She's tried every treatment there is without success. She's what is called a null responder. In 2012, her doctor extolled the virtues of a new treatment I started the treatment in late November 2012, around the 26th, I think. I was very affected, very weakened. From that point on, I had a throbbing in my head, my neck, and generalized muscular and skeletal pain. 
Douleur au niveau de genre sy syndrome pain here, like a hook in my eye that paralyzed my whole face and hurt all the way down my arm. My face was horrible, disfigured. I was just destroyed. I was often fearful when I went to sleep at night. I'd think I wasn't going to wake up tomorrow. And in the morning when I woke up, I was so relieved. And a new day of struggling would begin. I even got to the point, if you can believe it, where I'd think, I've never said this before, but I'd think that if I died, at least they'd understand what I was suffering. It's ridiculous, but that's what I thought. I was grieving for myself. Sophie Chipon's health deteriorated so badly that in April 2013, she was hospitalized. Her doctor believed that she was reacting badly to Victrelis. The unanimous reaction, both of GPs and of people with no expertise whatsoever, but it was what everyone was saying at the time, was to say that, at worst, Mrs. Chipon, even if we haven't eradicated your virus, at least during the past 11 months, we've protected your liver. That was the consolation prize. Everyone unanimously agreed. Except that, unfortunately, that's not at all what happened. My cirrhosis level had been at 14%, and at the end of the treatment, I went up to 61%. 14 to 61 is like night and day. Your life expectancy is completely different. The situation changes entirely, it's urgent. I was in a critical condition. Since then, Sophie Chipon's health has never really improved. To try and end the illness, she was prescribed a new drug. Last year, she pressed charges against persons unknown. She wanted to know if the French authorities and the laboratory knew that she should not have taken Victrelis. There was no valid, relevant scientific reason to say that these patients would get any therapeutic benefit from this drug. Did the expert know? Everyone knew. Did Merck know? Of course. So without knowing any better, people took a drug with terrible side effects for nothing. And if we wanted to be really cynical, we could also talk about the extra cost for the taxpayers and the extra profit for manufacturers. Bernard Alberg was dismissed for gross misconduct a few months later. But he doesn't regret speaking out about his experience. He had no desire to be involved in a possible drug scandal. I'm not one of those people who say the pharmaceutical industry is shameful. Not everything's black or white. We mustn't forget that the pharmaceutical industry has produced absolutely incredible medicines. The problem is that certain manufacturers deliberately slip through the overlarge holes of the approval system and of the drug's lifespan. They steamroll everything and make money to the detriment of public health. 